In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain Report comes from the Book of First Kings, and since it is President's, uh, President's Day and because we are talking about this, I think that it's really only appropriate that we take a second to look at what God sees as the ideal leader for a people or as a nation. And sometimes the way to understand what the ideal is is to look at the exact opposite of that, to look at somebody that fell short in all of those categories, and that's going to be the subject of our chaplain's report today. So we go first to 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 52. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, in the way of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Now, that last phrase right there, where it talks about King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, being one who caused Israel to sin, that was something that was very jarring to me the first time that I saw it. And maybe it's because my own mentality comes from such an individualist point of view, and, and maybe it's also a combination of my own understanding of the theology of the Scripture. Because we'll see in the Torah, even back in the Old Law, that no man shall bear the sin of his father, nor the father bear the sin of his son, that everybody's accountable for his own sins, and you're not going to punish the father for what the son did and vice versa. The Bible takes a very individualistic approach. It takes less of an individualistic approach in the beginning in the Old Testament because God was the, uh, the God who looked after the nation of Israel. He looked after other nations, of course, too, but the primary narrative is God preparing the way of the Christ and doing so through the people of Israel. The New Testament, of course, moves to a borderless nation of God that goes beyond any kind of physical realm, and as Jesus said, his kingdom is not of this world. And so it takes, it's able to take a little bit more individualistic approach. But even back in the Old Testament, you still weren't held accountable for sins that other people committed. And so I looked at that first and I was like, well, now, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. How can a king cause a nation to sin? You can't be held accountable for bad things that your leaders did. And so it caused this real schism in me where I had to dig deep and try to figure out exactly what was going on here, what was that verse saying, what all was implied with the Bible saying that King Jeroboam caused Israel to sin. So here's eventually uh, where I came, what I came up with. How can one man cause a nation to sin? I think that the first step that you have to take in figuring out exactly what that means is, what did Jeroboam do? What did King Jeroboam do in his life that would have led him to cause Israel to sin, as the scripture says? Well, Jeroboam committed treason against Solomon. Solomon was the king at the time, and Jeroboam basically said that he was going to take the kingdom away from Solomon. Solomon and he got, uh, they were very mad at each other, and Jeroboam actually fled to Egypt. But he had committed treason against his king. And then, after Solomon died and his son Rehoboam took over, Jeroboam went to Samaria and wound up becoming king. So he was involved in, uh, in treason against Solomon, and then after Solomon died, he was also involved in splitting the kingdom and becoming the king of the northern kingdom, despite the fact that King Rehoboam was still ruling in Jerusalem. So he helped split the nation. He also changed the days of the feast, changed the rituals of the laws of Moses. He adjusted things, and part of the reason he did that is because he wanted power. It was so important to him to cons consolidate his power and say, hey, no, God is really with us. He's not with those people in Jerusalem. And he was so concerned about people slipping away and, and joining back up with, with Jerusalem and, and the Jews in Judea and the children of Judah 
that he wanted to make sure that it would be very difficult for them to do that. And so he started changing the days of rituals. He started changing how the rituals were done and who was conducting them and that kind of thing. He openly defied the law of Moses, the law that had been handed down to the children of Israel from God because he was worried that his own power would go away, his earthly power, that his command over 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so ultimately, this is what happened, is that that split took place. And he was like, no, no, we're not going to listen to the law of Moses anymore. What we're going to do is we're going to do things our own way, because then it's a lot harder for people to just reintegrate into being citizens of the united nation of Israel to be under the kings that are in the lineage of King David. And probably, I would say, arguably the worst sin is in, a, in the same vein of trying to create that separate culture, he made altars to false gods. He actually made altars in the high places to worship gods that were not his god, that were not the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was his great folly. That was the evil that he decided to engage in. And he was telling Israel, no, this is okay. We're going to do this. This is going to be part of who we are as a nation now. You know, there were experiments conducted in the wake of the Holocaust because there were psychologists that were just fascinated with how is it possible that a person could see the horrible, evil things that they were doing to Jews and other people in concentration camps and just think that it was okay to do them. They did this series of experiments, and I won't go into all the details because that's beyond the scope of our chaplain's report, but essentially their findings were, as long as a person in a position of authority told you it was okay, you would do it. Which terrifies me and should terrify every human being that, they, that we are that open to suggestion. But ultimately, that's what happened with King Jeroboam in Israel. With the person in authority saying, no, 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 it's okay to go worship other gods. It's okay to have these idols and to sacrifice to them. That's the legacy of King Jeroboam. Because I think, ultimately, we look at the deeds and then we have to look at the results. What happened as a result of King Jeroboam doing what he did? Well... There was not one single good king over Israel. Not one. Occasionally, in the lineage of David in Judah, now the majority of those kings were bad too, but occasionally a good reformer did come up. You had Hezekiah or Josiah or some other kings of, of Judah that would come to prominence in the southern kingdom, and they would start doing what God told them to do. Not a single one. Not one in Jeroboam's line did. They were all bad. They were all rotten to the core. They all chased after foreign gods. And that's the legacy that he did. He also had his own kingdom ravaged by the Assyrians. That, of course, happened way after he died. But because of their folly, because of Israel's evil, God warned them with prophets over and over again, guys, you got to stop it, you got to knock it off, or you're going to be punished for that. You're going to fall into the Assyrians' rule. They ignored the prophets, killed most of them. And then, of course, the Assyrians wound up taking over. And because of that, the ten tribes of Israel in the northern kingdom, they didn't survive. That's not to say that they were completely wiped out by genocide, because many of them weren't. But they bred in with other nations, they lost their their uh, lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of that, they ceased being really Israelites. They were not culturally Jewish. They were not Jewish in the sense that their lineage came from Abraham. All of that went away. And to this day, the only Jews left are Jews. The word Jew comes from Judah, and that's because that was really the only tribe that survived. You had a few Benjamites and Levites that survived, but more or less, they were all gone. And so, because of that, the legacy of Jeroboam is destruction. He openly defied God. He was so worried about his own power that he was willing to ignore God's commands. And look where it led him. 
So when the Bible says that he caused Israel to sin, his actions made it easier for people to defy God. And because of that, and because he created an environment in which following God was very hard to do, and doing it the way that God told him to do in the Torah was very hard to do, and following these false and evil gods, these made-up idols, was very easy to do, well, we see the results. Those lost tribes of Israel just aren't around anymore. And never will be again. You see, ultimately, kings like Jeroboam, leaders like Jeroboam, wind up doing far more harm for the people they are leading than good. Because any time a leader makes it harder to do what God asks you to do, destruction is going to follow. And that's why if you are a leader, if you are somebody that has been put in charge of something, whether it's an entire nation or it's just your own household, you bear a very heavy burden. And that burden is to make those that are in your charge make it as easy as possible for them to live the kind of life that God commanded them to do. Because if you don't, and the environment that you create makes it harder for them to do the right thing, their blood is on your hands. That's why we have to be very, very cautious and humble when accepting a role of leadership. Because leaders, especially when we're talking about politics, they can't make an individual sin. They can't make an individual person. They can't force him to do something wrong. But they can create that negative environment. And they can cause an entire nation, because of that environment, fall into sin and into decline, just like Jeroboam did. You see, this is exactly why our founders tried, with the presidency, to make it less important and less impactful and give those people less power. Because they knew that we were going to have some bad leaders. I mean, it's a human being. We're going to have some bad ones. We're going to pick some bad ones. That's who we are as a race. That's who we are as a people. And because our founders understood that and knew that, they said, you know what? We're going to give them as little power as humanly possible. We'll just have them do just the bare basic minimum. And then hope that the, the, the average person will do the rest, because if that's the case, at least they'll only mess up their own lives as opposed to everybody else's. That's why the founders were afraid of giving one person too much power, or the government itself too much power, regardless of what form it took. And that's the reason that on this President's Day, we're thankful for the office, at least as the founders intended it. A person that managed the country, but didn't have a whole lot of influence over the daily lives of the people. Because they knew the Bible. They looked through stories like this and saw how easy it is for power to corrupt people and for that corruption to spread when that corruption is in the leader of a nation. That's why they tried to make the president less important. And that's why we as individuals ultimately should always look to God for our guidance. Not a government, not a king, not an individual. We follow God. And honestly, nothing else really matters. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances. <laughs>